Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. There's a lot of hope in, in the fact that things are changing all the time. And uh, I feel like you can't go on a, a trip like Mel and I did without without feeling weirdly hopeful about the future of life on the planet. I mean, you encounter so many people that are that are decent and they just want, you know, love and the basics for their family and mean no ill will to anyone else. And I do think those kinds of people are far more common than the tyrants and the, the you know, massive CEOs, heads of corporations that are inflicting harm left and right. Um, it's just a matter of how can we, how can we summon that more positive energy and, and put it to work. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 45, where I learned to stop complaining about the weather, because at least I'm not biking on a snowy peak 17,000 feet above sea level. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured, or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Kate Harris about her book, Lands of Lost Borders, A Journey on the Silk Road. Kate Harris is a writer with a grudge against borders and a knack for getting lost. Her essays, travel features, and poetry have appeared in The Walrus, Canadian Geographic, Sierra, Cut Bank, Arc Poetry Magazine, and The Georgia Review, among other publications, and cited in Best American Essays and Best American Travel Writing. A Rhodes Scholar and Moorhead Kane Scholar, she was named one of Canada's top modern-day explorers, and in 2012 won the Ellen Malloy Desert Writers Award. Her journeys edging the limit of nations, science, and sanity have taken her to all seven continents, often by ski or bike. She's been profiled in Guernica, The Globe and Mail, Vogue, Germany, and the short film The Art of Wild. When she isn't wandering the world for work and play, she lives off-grid with her wife and dog in a log cabin in Atlin, British Columbia. Lands of Lost Borders is her first book. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. All right, hello everyone and welcome to Read, Learn, Live. My name is John Monaster, and I am here today with Kate Harris, author of Lands of Lost Borders, A Journey on the Silk Road. Kate, say hello. Hi, everyone, and John. <laughs> Thanks. We are happy to have you here. And uh, this is really a wonderful, interesting book, combining all sorts of elements of memoir and travelogue. And I'd like to really just start off by having the author summarize the book for us. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Lands of Lost Borders is essentially about a bike ride. My best friend, Melissa, and I took on the Silk Road. Um, but it's also an exploration of the ways borders of all kind shape and shatter our world. And it's an exploration of exploration itself. You know, this this basic impulse to figure out what in the universe we're all doing here. Um, yeah, so it digs into that. And before all this, I know that you had published an article about some of your travels and you kept a blog, you had a video camera, you were taking photos. So you've been documenting this trip in other ways, but just curious about why you decided to turn this into a book. Why was the book the right way to tell this story? Well, Biking the Silk Road itself was a dream that came about through reading a bunch of books. And so it, it sort of seemed to me that's what you did if you had the chance to go on a grand journey then your your duty almost was to to come home and and write about it and share the tale and um for me i i grew up reading books about adventure and travel and exploration 
And I was so grateful as a kid growing up in small town, Ontario, you know, I never traveled anywhere until I was in my um, late teens and went off to university. Yeah, I hadn't basically seen beyond the borders of, of my province, never mind um, home country. And books were my portal to that wider world. I traveled in words long before I ever traveled the world. And so it, I, I don't know, I guess it just seemed the natural thing to do that after, after going on this expedition myself, I would, I would come home and try and uh, render it in words. And of course, writing itself is this incredible journey and, and form of exploration. And in some ways, the sense of discovery and, and revelation and um, the impact of the trip really hit home for me more during the writing process than the trip itself. Mm, that, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can understand how during the trip, you know, as you discuss in the book, you really just like focused on the trip and the next day and making it and your bike not falling apart and your visas for getting everything. So the, the, it sounds like what you're saying is the book really offered you an opportunity to reflect on the trip as a whole and lessons learned and all that. Yeah, exactly. You're so focused on the the day to day details of propelling yourself from one place to the next during the trip that um, letting a sort of bigger meanings or, or impacts sink in isn't really possible in the moment. It takes some distance from the day to day itself, I think. And uh, so, yeah, the writing offered that that distance. And so how did you actually go about writing the book? And there's there's lots of details, really specific, interesting, fascinating details about the families you met and the everything that happened. So I'm assuming you, you, you took a pretty good, kept a pretty good journal. So what was the process like of, of turning that into a book? Well, on the trip itself, I, I tried to think of writing or more accurately documentation as like my only job, you know, other than just living the adventure, my duty on the Silk Road was to, to get it down. Um, and this was in part because I wanted to write a book after. Um, and also because becoming a writer was really my only possible future. I don't know. I'd burned, I'd burned bridges to what I was doing before the Silk Road trip in terms of being a scientist. And, um, so I was kind of staking everything on, on being a writer and, I, I've always found language electrifying and um, a really intense kind of exploration, just, just reading a book. Um, and so I wanted to try and put some of that energy back into the world on the page myself. Um, so yeah, I kept journals during the trip. I, uh, Mel and I filmed a bunch of it because we were hoping to make a documentary as well, which never really transpired. Um, but it proved so helpful for writing the book because days I was too exhausted to actually get down much detail of say, you know, the, the color of a carpet in a family's home, we'd be taking photos and we'd be shooting video as well. And so I could kind of summon those details from these other media. Uh, yeah, that's helpful. Um, and so doing all that, was there anything that was particularly difficult when you were putting the book together or that you found challenging in an unexpected way? Oh, all of it. The all of it, the whole thing. Process. Uh, <laughs> it was so incredibly, it was the hardest thing I've, I've ever done. Was, was trying Harder to... than biking the Silk Road? Oh, was writing by the far, book? by okay. far. I mean, biking, you just put one pedal stroke after the next. Like it's, it's pretty linear, you know, and there's sort of a clear destination. Um, you know, you might get off track on the way hit detours and digressions, but, um, you generally know where, where you're aiming. And in the writing of the book, I didn't want it to be just a book about the day to day on the Silk Road. I didn't want it to be, you know, we woke up, we ate this, we went here, we slept and then repeat ad nauseum. I really wanted it to be this, this deeper sort of synthesis and exploration of ideas about exploration and borders and the history of science and space, outer space. Um, and so weaving in all those threads of the story that, that best um, reflected the sort of emotional arc and experience of the trip to me in a, a cohesive narrative, like it was hair tearing. <laughs> you know, it took me five five years of sort of working odd jobs, but mostly writing to, to write the book and to piece it together. And um, by far, it's it, I turned myself inside out to do it and 
yeah, it was intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, well, well, you're done with that. So the yeah. book is the book is there. So you know, catch my breath. <laughs> yeah, catch your breath, and then you know, phase two, which we're yeah. in right now. Uh, okay, well, yeah, let's let's talk about the book itself. Let's let's get into it. So you know, you you start off with sort of the beginning, uh, the true beginning of the story, which was uh, which was you and your life and your growing up. Uh, so what was what was it like for you growing up? What was your early life like? Um, well, I should start off by saying I was born into incredibly loving and lucky circumstances, you know, with parents that, that encouraged me to do crazy things like dream of going to space and, you know, made sure I always had books to read from the library. We weren't a well-off family by any means, but, um, rich in all the ways that matter, like love. And I never worried for food on the table. And, um, yeah. So I feel like I was, I was from the, from the get go, incredibly lucky in that respect. And, um, yeah, I grew up in small town, Ontario with my two younger brothers and parents in a menagerie, rotating menagerie of animals. Um, I was really into horses and books and outer space. I, I wanted to be an astronaut as a kid and um, so studied hard at school for that reason. Oh. Yeah, I remember I, I also wanted to be an astronaut. I think it's interesting because oh, yeah. I, think, I think I remember reading something about some personality test or or something where it was like essentially it was putting people in two categories astronomers or astronauts oh interesting. and thinking about thinking about people that either wanted to kind of from home look at everything or people that wanted to actually go to the places and report back oh wow that's such an interesting like binary to think about right yeah. I mean, and of course yeah there's of course it's not necessarily just so black and white always but yeah i thought that was an interesting way yeah. of of framing the difference between the types of people and what you might want to do going forward. Yeah. So it makes oh, sense to me that you were the explorer astronaut version. Astronaut type. Yeah. yeah. Although the irony is that to be an astronaut, I mean, you have to spend a lot of time as an astronomer for sure. Yeah. Well, just Both as a, I mean, and a scientist in, in so many ways, you know, before you can even think about actually going anywhere, you have to sort of prove yeah. yourself, it seems. Yeah. As a scientist. So some fusion. So, you know, one of the things you talked about is this outward bound experience. And it seems like that was somewhat of a turning point in your dream to become an explorer. So what was that all about? And and how did that affect you and, and what it meant for becoming an explorer for you? Yeah, the outward bound course I, I got to go on was a revelation in so many respects. But, um, you know, I read all these books about people going on adventures and climbing the tallest mountains and traversing deserts but i i had no idea like I, i'd gone car camping as a kid with my family but um they weren't into like wilderness expeditions and you have to go pretty far from where i grew up to find wilderness in, in ontario quite far north and so it so i had these wild notions of what i wanted to do you know go to the far flung corners of the world the fringes and and trek across them and um no real idea of how you actually go about doing that so like how do, how do you pack a backpack carrying you know just the basics of what you need to keep life going in a far-flung place and Outward Bound taught me all of that and um, basically I did a course in the canyon lands of Utah and so we spent time in both mountains and the canyons and uh, I just loved every second of having to slog around under a 55 pound backpack and navigate with a map um, it was just exhausting and exhilarating in, in every moment. And I finished that course really feeling equipped, like, okay, I can, I know how to do this in a Utah desert. Now I can take that to, you know, the Gobi desert of Mongolia. Um, so it really felt like it, it was just the sort of rocket booster in terms of launching me into other contexts with the, the skills and knowledge and, and mostly just the confidence to, set off into wild places. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's really important and critical because I know that I didn't have I didn't have quite so many travel experiences growing up and it wasn't until much later when I finally started to just go kind of on my own in my 20s that I was like, okay, I, I can't actually handle this. It's going to be okay. And 
And yeah. I think as you as you travel more, you start to realize that you can get away with planning less and having less control and knowing that it's going to work out. You know, it's it, there. There will be places to stay anywhere you go. It's you know, it's it's okay. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that, that's so such a true. funny revelation yeah. that I've noticed. Absolutely, and um, yeah, I don't know. The Outward Bound course was part of this scholarship I got as an undergrad, and mm -hmm. there were such a mix of reactions among the other students to the chance, the opportunity to go on this course, and some, some loved it and wanted to take that that knowledge and that understanding of how little you really need to to have you know an intense beautiful experience in the world um they wanted to take that further and some were just sort of glad they did it and would never want to do it again um yeah, so yeah. and that's fine you know different personalities so you know different do, strokes do, do, yeah different strokes do what makes you happy um, exactly. So it is good to have an experience like that then, right, to really help people make that decision. But, you know, at least put yourself out there, you know, have that one experience to know. So that's that's good that you were able to do that. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things I noticed as you were talking early on in the book was that you, you know, you read a lot and you were talking about lots of other explorers and you learned about them in history. You read some of their, then you read some of their personal journals and books and it seemed like there was a disconnect that you noticed, and it make which makes sense in that history is told in different ways by different people, and and so I'm just curious about how that kind of affected you and and what you noticed across your journey as well, and just in terms of what you were told versus what happened, and how history portrays things differently depending on who you talk to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was certainly a hero worshiper as a kid, you know, I would really idolize certain figures and place them on a pedestal and, um, people like Marco Polo for one and, um, Charles Darwin when I got a little bit older and, um, when I would dig deeper into the sort of glossy romantic image of these, these figures in history, I was often pretty let down. Like, um, you know, Marco Polo, if you actually read the, unabridged edition of his travels it's pretty dull and mm. it's essentially like a lonely planet guide to um what you could buy and sell along the silk road and where you could buy and sell it like he was a merchant he wasn't a, an explorer you know a seeker of truth and beauty or anything like that and um so he became a fallen hero and then you know, darwin i had read his uh, Voyage of the Beagle and loved that book and also read his journals from that spell in his life, um, which revealed him as just such a restless wanderer, you know, full of, full of wonder and curiosity about the world around him and um, continually obsessed with, with trying to puzzle out how sort of interconnected life is on, on the planet and um, his theory of evolution by natural selection came out of that came out of his travels very directly and um what disappointed me about darwin and, and disappointed is maybe unfair to the man himself more like i was just saddened to read that um when he was older uh he he sort of lost his sense of wonder he lost his sense of curiosity he wasn't able to take joy in things like poetry and music and beautiful landscapes the way he had when he was younger um I mean, it basically just sounds like he was kind of kind of depressed and, and ready to be done with the world by the time he was an older man. And he had family issues that like he lost. He and his wife lost their um, beloved child at, at one point, and um, he was afflicted with this mysterious illness for the rest of his life after the Beagle voyage. So there, you know, there are reasons you might get depressed under such circumstances, but I was really haunted by what seemed to be a pretty stark transition from sort of restless wanderer to sort of morose scientist who describes himself as a, a machine for grinding out theoretical frameworks from, from collected facts. And he, he lamented the loss of who he used to be. And uh, yeah, so I was just very haunted by um, that gap between sort of the idealized explorer and then the realized explorer. Hmm. 
before we get into the the multiple trips you took and everything, I, I want to talk about bicycling uh, because you, you know there there are lots of different ways to get around in this world, and you picked a very specific one um, to use. And you know you biked with a what seemed like a very heavy bike. You biked through ridiculously difficult paths, kind of up and down huge mountains, and you were thousands of you know of miles or thousands of feet above sea level. Uh, it just was not not easy, not an easy ride. And you had this great quote about riding. You, you said, "Ride far enough, and the world becomes strange and unknown to you. And ride a little farther, and you become strange and unknown to yourself." not to mention your riding companion. So, you know, with all that in mind, what drew you to biking in particular? And, and, and in terms of your desire to become an explorer, why was the bike your tool of choice? And, and how, did, how did you feel connected with your bike while you were on this trip? Yeah, well, I was never a cyclist per se, uh, certainly not before the trip. Um, I owned a bike that was stolen my first week at university. So for the next four years, I didn't have a bike at all. And it was just a, you know, beater commuter bike. Um, and so it, it was a rather random choice of vehicle for which to you know, undertake these explorations. But I, I was compelled by the idea. So I loved hiking and backpacking mm-hmm. ever since that outward bound course. Um, but you can only get so far on two feet and, some people can really push that and travel incredible distances, but a bicycle struck me as a way to, to get a little further while still moving under your own power and, um, hiking along a road didn't sound too appealing, but, but bicycles would make use of the roads that were out there in the world. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was kind of a random choice. I'd heard of other people traveling by bicycle and it just struck me as this really elegant, simple, cheap emphasis on cheap way to see the world and it's an incredibly democratic form of travel like people ride bikes in all the countries we traveled through bikes were deployed in daily life as a means of transport and um a source of joy riding just like back home and um so it's really neat to to move through places by a means of transportation that the locals themselves use and i feel like when you rock up to a place on a bicycle, um, the people there have maybe a bit more respect for how you earned your arrival. Um, whereas if you just step off a tour bus, you're kind of instantly dismissed as, um, a more superficial category of, of tourist. And so I, I feel like bicycles open up more conversations and more curiosity in the people that you, you meet along the way. But yeah, it was kind of a random choice initially, but I, I've become a devoted cyclist since and a huge champion for the bicycle as a, a means of exploration. Yeah, and it definitely struck me throughout the book when you told stories about uh, either going to you know bike shops in far off lands or allowing people other people to ride your bikes and seeing what happened and yeah. how excited they were. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely a an interesting option. Um, so it's the, the next part you you kind of did this whole silk road thing in in two parts and there's the beginning you had this little first chunk and then you kind of paused and then you came back later and did the the huge remainder of of the trip so where did you get that first idea to bike that first part of the silk road that really kicked off this whole multi-year journey yeah i i was in my this was my fourth year of my undergraduate degree and um i completely won the lottery in terms of school in that i got a full ride scholarship to the university of north carolina at chapel hill and this scholarship i accepted it you know i was i was from canada i'd never even been to the american south when i i applied to and then was offered this scholarship which is called the moorhead cane um i accepted it without hesitation as soon as they offered it to me over the phone because it came with uh, summer travel grants. And so every summer you could basically like pitch an idea, a place you wanted to go and something productive you wanted to do there. And they would, they would fund it, like buy you a plane ticket and send you off. So it was as it, someone who'd never even you know seen a mountain or a desert or an ocean before I went off to school. It was, it was mind blowing. Um, and 
as part of this summer travel grant program they have, one of the summers is very open-ended and you, you essentially choose whatever you want to do, wherever you want to do it. And it has to have some study dimension, but um, that can be pretty loosely interpreted. And so I, I pitched the idea of retracing Marco Polo's travels in, in China on the Chinese stretch, stretch of the Silk Road and sort of looking at the differences that had evolved in the, the centuries spanning our journey. So it was a pretty you know, non-rigid um, non pitch for a, a trip. Like I'm kind of surprised in retrospect that they, they funded it. But yeah, they set me loose and I proposed to do it by bicycle. And um, I wanted to hit up that part of the world with that um, Marco Polo focus in part because he had become this fallen hero to me. You know, I had this romantic vision of him as a kid. And then when I was at university, I read the the full edition of his travels and realized he was, he was a merchant, not an explorer. And I really wanted to celebrate those stretches of the Silk Road that he really didn't, didn't think much of. He dismissed mountains and deserts as obstacles, um, as things that stood in the way of, of progress and profit. And so I wanted to instead travel the wild Silk Road and uh, celebrate its wildness as opposed to its civilized aspects. Mm. That's an interesting way to think about it, right? I mean, it's almost like you you decided to try and be the counterpart of Marco Polo. You know, you were you were filling in the gaps that he he left. Yeah, that was the vision. That yeah. was certainly the vision. And and so I remember you wrote in the book, and it's clear from from reading the book, you're sort of very good at school in the sense that you know you were you were there, you got then you got into Oxford, then you got into MIT. So you know you're kind of going to some very prestigious uh, uh, institutions, and you went to Oxford later after coming back from the trip and and all that to study science, and you switched to the history of science, and you, and you talked about that for a bit. So why did you decide to switch to the history of science and, and what did you really take away from your time at, at Oxford? Part of why I poured myself into my studies, you know, my whole life from elementary school and, and onward um, was that I, I wanted to be an astronaut and I knew I needed to become a scientist to get there. And I knew I needed to excel at being a, a scientist to get there. And so I really aim for aim for that and um, worked incredibly hard first in you know public high schools and then that opened up doors to these scholarships later um, and it was because I was I was aiming for Mars um, and you know there's that saying it's almost a cliche now but like you aim for what is it you aim for the moon and you land among the stars or something like that mm. and I, I sort of feel that way about Mars like I I was studying with it in mind and instead got detoured into all these other fantastical, quite otherworldly adventures and um, places. And uh, when I went to Oxford, so I studied science as an undergrad and then won this incredible scholarship full ride to Oxford. Um, and I could choose to study whatever I wanted there. I wasn't limited to doing what I'd already done, which was sort of this this exhilarating option. Like suddenly I could do something totally different and um, it wouldn't matter for the person I was trying to become because I was going to go on to grad school in science afterwards. And so what, what was I going to do for two years when I had that sort of blank slate presented to me? Um, and I pretty quickly settled on studying the history of science, which is essentially the history of exploration. Um, and that gave me the excuse to read like, exploration narratives and expedition diaries for homework instead of in my spare time. Hmm. And then you sort of went to MIT and started a doctorate and then kind of didn't, that's, that's kind of where your formal schooling stopped. Right. And that, that's kind yeah. of where it became like, that's the, did, you, did you kind of make a decision there that like student of the world was more your, style or you know what, what what happened there that then led to the next big portion of the trip well it turned out as much as i loved thinking about science and and writing about science i was really terrible at doing it like i was 
I was a bad research student. I was restless. Um, I'd get distracted by literally things happening out, out the window and mess up experiments. And I just, I was not finding joy or fulfillment or any sense of um, being good at, at stuff in doing science. And it was there I really realized, I mean, Oxford was sort of this two year blip of doing something different, writing about science instead of doing it. And I loved it. it. It felt like a kind of challenging play as opposed to work. And then I, I went to MIT after because I was still sort of convinced that that's what I had to do. You know, I was on this path to Mars and that's where you go if you want to get there and showed up and very earnestly tried to, to um, follow that path and just found myself unhappy and unfulfilled and just really bad at it. <laughs> so it became pretty clear to me after a while that um, I I was best as an explorer on the page and not in the laboratory dealing with petri dishes. I was studying uh, geomicrobiology, which is a very, it can be a um, field focused course of study, but the way it, it plays out at MIT in the particular lab I ended up in. It's very laboratory, experimental um, oriented. And yeah, so I, I ultimately just couldn't take it anymore and quit grad school and decided I'd return to the Silk Road where, you know, I wasn't the first person to bike the Silk Road and um, yeah, it, wasn't a, it, was, it wasn't genuine exploration at all and yet it felt like everything i'd been after that 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 sort of spirit of exploring that i thought you could only find on mars i had felt on the silk road that first time and i felt when i wrote about my travels and so i decided to to aim for that as opposed to another planet hmm. well i mean it, it's interesting because you kind of reference the experiences you had i think you were and i don't want to call this wrong because you got annoyed with people in the book who called it wrong, but you underwent some sort of uh, astronaut-like experience in the desert somewhere. <laughs> space camp is what you're space, trying not to say? I didn't, I mean, I don't <laughs> want to call it space camp. I know that you were annoyed by that. So there was some sort of space exploration occurring on this yeah. planet. Um, and then, it, but, but I understand what you mean. I, I guess from reading the book, it was sort of like, wow, yeah, she's this is a snow-capped peak and here's a desert and here's a lake for the first time in hundreds of miles and here's a village and here's a bridge and so it seems like there are plenty of i think what i really took away was like wow like this is a part of the world that has an incredibly diverse array of beautiful and challenging and interesting vistas and things to do that we might not even think about and for people that are you know, dreaming and, and exploring and thinking about other planets that, you know, there's still so much to see here on this one that might totally blow your mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, the space experience you're, um, very gently referencing was, uh, a two week Mars simulation run by the Mars society in the Utah desert. And you basically go through all the motions of being on another world um, where you wear a fake space suit, you go through a fake airlock and have to wait till your deep, the air around you is depressurized to the point that you can exit. Um, and it, it, it just, the whole experience, it was fun. Like you're sort of play acting that you're on Mars, but it was also so weird and so removed from the world around me that it felt almost like a video game or a simulacrum. Like I wasn't really, really there. And, um, for me that, especially having done the outward bound course in Utah and loved it so much and then returning in a, a spacesuit and space helmet and just feeling like I wasn't even in Utah. I was in a projection of Utah on the, the plastic visor of my space helmet it felt like virtual reality and I wanted real reality. Mm -hmm. Um, and certainly, you know, as a kid, I'd, I'd sort of written off this planet as a as a world of diminished possibilities. Um, you know, the age of exploration, the golden age, anyway, as being long over. Um, and I think now, having seen more of the world and and traveled it in some pretty intense ways, I 
can testify that is so far from the truth. You know, this planet is so, it's weirder and wilder and more heartbreaking and more hopeful than I ever would have dreamed as a kid in reading about it in books in small town Ontario. And like Mars doesn't hold a, a candle to what we have here. Like, and it's not that we shouldn't explore Mars. I'm still fascinated by the idea of there being uh, life there, past or present. And, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to explore another world. Um, but there are worlds within this world worth exploring right out the back door. You don't even have to go as far as the Silk Road to find a word, a road worthy of, of traveling. Mm. And so with all those travels, though, come come some challenges. And, and I, I think you documented them pretty pretty well in the book. I mean, you've got drenching rain in the Black Sea. You had snow-covered roads that you could barely see. Um, you had various bike issues happen. You had mechanical um, issues. You had these, like, visa problems. Um, so, you know, there was a lot to deal with. Yeah. And it really seems like you just had such a tenacity. I mean, you, you definitely wrote about the times when you just were sick or felt like knocking out of bed or whatever, but you still sort of persevered and you still made this happen when I think a lot of people might have given up or stopped and, and, and not continued. And I, you even wrote this this quote, the colder and harsher the terrain, the more I seem to come alive in it. So, so how do you sort of explain that? How do you, how did you stay motivated? How did you push yourself to keep going forward and overcoming all these obstacles during the trip? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I still kind of wonder at it. I mean, I, when I'm giving readings of the book and I'm reading passages that, about times that were really, really challenging and tough, I'm just like, well, how did I keep going? Yeah. And part of the answer is Mel. I, you know, I was traveling with this, incredible um other human being my my buddy mel we've been friends since we were 10 years old and it helped that the stretches i found hardest she didn't find that difficult and those aspects of the trip i found like exhilarating and and amazing she sometimes found more difficult and so we can we could sort of carry each other through um what was personally hard and you know, she somehow was unfazed by traffic and freezing rain. And I, I really did feel like I was happiest in the, the colder, wilder train of the trip. And that was train that Mel was less comfortable in. And so there was always someone having something of a good time. And I think that helped for sure. And also, I love the kind of travel. I mean, I guess they call it type two fun. Like you're, you're glad you, you live through it later. Um, and so much of what I'd read in, in books about expeditions and explorers of the past, like I was drawn to that kind of glorious suffering, um, in literature. And so to, to do it out in the world felt kind of right. Like, well, this is what, this is what I wanted was to, to suffer for the sublime. Uh, yeah, I love that phrase, glorious suffering. And a lot of what you were writing about, actually, uh, I don't know if you ever used to read Calvin and Hobbes that as a kid, but there is a particular strip that reminded me of, and his dad was always getting them to do crazy things, and they were actually bicycling in the rain, and Calvin was complaining, and his dad was like, no, no, this builds character. Like, you're, you're building yes. character. You can just keep going. <laughs> like. And that was his thing. He would always be biking. He'd always be out in the rain. He didn't care. And it's, yeah. it struck me as very, very much the same idea. Oh, I should put that that strip up on my wall. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you mentioned Mel. And you guys have been friends since you were 10. I mean, this is obviously an incredibly deep friendship. And now you're spending day in, day out with this person for months on end in these challenging conditions so how did your friendship with Mel evolve over the course of the journey? Oh, uh, yeah, it was, you know, there were few people on earth that I could be cooped up with in a tent or you know, stuck on a busy road with or dealing with bureaucratic challenges with. And Mel is Mel is one of them. Like she's we certainly bickered at different points. We're almost like sisters by now. Like we've just lived through so many epic phases of life together and had such wacky adventures both abroad and at home that um 
yeah, we can sort of, we can fight and forgive each other in the matter of like minutes. Um, she's, we're super different. Like Mel, Mel's incredibly like, she's quite outgoing and extremely funny. And she would always manage to find some like quirky, absurd take on a situation that I was just frustrated by um, and therefore make it less frustrating. I feel like that's like this real gift she has. Um, but yeah, by the end of the trip, we were certainly ready to spend time with, with some other people mm. because especially with the language barriers all the way, all the way along the Silk Road, you're having sort of pretty superficial conversations with, with most of the people you meet. And then the only deep conversations that we could have were with each other because we, we spoke the same language and, um, that's a lot of intense time with one person, but, uh, yeah, no, we're still dear friends. And, um, she lives in Toronto now with her family. She just had her second child and, uh, I'm hoping she'll be game for another adventure once the kids are a little older. <laughs> Well, that's good. I'm glad you guys uh, uh, retain the friendship. I think that's always the, the challenge when it comes to traveling is, I think, and I've experienced yeah. this, where there are some people that you're great friends with, but they're not always great. You don't always mesh well as traveling friends. It's not not quite the same thing. Yeah. So, well, I think really... Mel, both Mel and I, like she has an outgoing side, but she also has this really solitary side, as do I. And the two of us can happily just like, line a tent reading for hours and not, you know, not feel the need to make conversation, not, not feel confined by that. Um, and I, I, I read this in the book, but it, yeah, it was, it was our ability to be alone together that I think let us survive the trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wise words. So you mentioned as you were traveling, you know, obviously you encountered tons of other people across, I, I don't know, you, over 10 countries, however many countries you visited. So, you, you know, you're really experiencing all these different cultures. You talk about you got taken in by families, you went to birthday parties, you, you know, all sorts of craziness was happening. So, you know, do you have any favorite stories to share? Or, you know, what did you really learn? Did you learn anything global about what people were like as you were meeting these different people from different countries? I think actually that birthday party encounter sort of is this beautiful juxtaposition of like the modern and the not ancient, but yeah, I don't know quite what the right word is, but so we're, we're pulled into this birthday party for this 10 year old, um, in Turkey and all the, all the men like disappeared. They went off, I guess the tea house or smoking hookah. I don't know. They were gone and we were left in this room with all these kids and all these uh, older women and then one of them like dials up skype and calls in i don't i don't even know who it was but some friend of theirs and then has the friend talk to us so we're like yeah having you know a skype conversation with a total stranger in this stranger's house in this chaotic birthday party with music thumping in the background and balloons flying everywhere and uh it was just such a neat I don't know, exercise in like connection and disconnection at once. Um, so I think, yeah, people in, in Turkey clearly are as, as online as the rest of us. And uh, yeah, it, it's amazing when you enter different people's homes, um, there are like a few factors that make a home a home, it seems. And, you know, whether it's family photos on the wall or um, like, a, a gathering place where like food is served. Um, and it was striking to me, like how, how alike homes are everywhere, whether it's like how they, they feel the sort of family, family space, um, or how they're decorated. There's a lot of commonalities across cultures as to, to what makes a place feel like home. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting side foray into the the commonalities of family. Yeah. And so then taking your experiences with all these people, you also had, of course, many experiences with the places and the governments and understanding the geography and the history. And so 
I think one of the things you do a great job of in the book is is weaving that into each of the descriptions about where you're going. So I think you, you, you tend to talk about what's been going on when you visit, before, how things are intertwined. So you definitely did a lot of research. And so I'm just curious to know about, you know, why you thought that was important or helpful and, and, uh, and I guess how much time you spent really trying to understand the past for all the different places before you got going. Yeah, the research happened both before, pretty much before or after the trip. There's not much that happened during it because we're just yeah. busy on the road. But um, it felt really important in the book to weave in the the larger dimensions of a given family's story. You know, where what country they're in, in the in the often like very tangled and difficult history of that country. Um, yeah, where, where sort of national and historical factors meet individual people, um, it felt important to sort of weave those together because they are deeply woven. Um, and I hope what comes across too is, is sort of my continuous bewilderment. I, 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 mean, I just feel like even though we traveled slowly and even though we lingered in places and with, with different people along the way, um, I still feel like my, my understanding, whatever that is, you know, whether academic understanding or emotional understanding, my understanding of the, the Silk Road and its history and its present is still, still feels very superficial. Like, um, there's only so much you can, you can learn as a foreigner kind of skipping through a place on a bicycle. And so digging deeper into a, a country's history was a way of, of trying to make that less superficial, I guess, my, my understanding. Yeah. And I think, and you make sort of an interesting distinction sometimes when you're talking about tourists and, and you mentioned people just getting off a bus versus you guys showing up on a bike and, you know, connecting with families and that sort of thing. Do you, do you have a sense of where you were seeing the most tourists versus the places that seemingly it was just you and Mel and the bikes and, and why was that? Why is it that people are drawn to certain places, not others? Well, I do definitely consider us tourists. I should say that straight off the bat. Like we were just, you know, a certain, a different kind of tourist that just happened to travel by bike. I, mm. when I was younger, I had very like exalted notions of like tourists versus travelers. And, um, but I, I just think that's probably pretty false to the reality, which is that everyone's an outsider when you go to a, another place and, um, you know, maybe your goals couldn't be different as a traveler versus a tourist. Um, and maybe a bicycle is a way of getting closer to the goals of really, really getting to know a place on a level that isn't just, um, an organized tour of, of what they want you to see. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm so harsh now in my judgments of, I think travel is, is valuable no matter what. I mean, you can, you can come out of, say you grew up in a suburb and you book a tour to Australia, like that's something to applaud and not, not criticize like any venturing outside of the familiar, even if it's into another fairly comfortable, familiar context in a different country. I still think it has a, the potential to transform you. Um, just seeing people in places where priorities play out extremely differently than where you're from. Um, so I would, yeah, I would encourage anyone, anyone to travel by, by whatever means. Um, and I just happen to like a bicycle because it's, it's fun to go places that aren't very crowded, I guess. And with the bicycle, you can steer directly there as opposed to, rely on the usual methods of transportation, which tend to take you to the usual places that other people go. Mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty deep thought to think about, huh? If you want to get somewhere <laughs> different, you have to move yourself differently. Yeah, uh, that's a great way to put it. So one of the other things that you briefly touch on, so, since we're kind of talking about just getting people out there in terms of traveling and th that being good, 
is you, you talk about these ideas of ecotourism, sustainable travel. You, know, you, you met when you were traveling with some NGOs and some other groups trying to uh, maybe build that sort of infra infrastructure. So how do you feel about those? Are those just kind of buzzwords? Are they useful? What, what's the current state of all that? Um, to some extent, they are buzzwords, but I, I do think the motives behind them are pretty pretty noble, um, if mostly aspirational at this point. You know, it's it's great to think of kinds of travel that really give back to the people who need help the most, you know, that support local communities or local businesses and don't just further pad the pockets of big corporations that run big tours to places. Um, so I think in that sense, yeah, ecotourism, if it can benefit landscapes and the communities that have to live in those landscapes, then um, I'm all for it. I do I do worry, and I, I express this in the book a bit, um, just with, I don't know, putting, I guess, commodifying experiences and encounters and all travel is doing that to some extent, you know, you're, you're paying to get places and, um, there can be a lot of transactional interactions where you're paying to get a bed and a, a meal. And, but I, I would hope people undertake whatever tourism, you know, it's most, most comfortable to them, um, in, with a different spirit, you know, like not just what can you get out of this place, but what can you, how can you let it change you and how can you maybe give back in a more meaningful way than just just passing by um i do yeah there's it's hard to have these buzzwords or i guess they, they remain buzzwords when they're um there aren't really sort of standards and ways of, of judging or or assuring those standards are met um so you know thinking of like organic coffee labels like if you see that certain badge on a bag of coffee then you can be pretty assured that it's it's abiding by certain standards that are internationally set and agreed to um and you can feel justifiably good about supporting that but i think ecotourism can just be slapped on any enterprise in any country and there's not much um accountability i guess and so i think it's worth really questioning like how is how is my experience in this place going to impact the place and ideally neutrally, maybe even more ideally positively, but at the very least neutrally. Hmm. And yeah, so, so kind of continuing down this rabbit hole for, for those of you playing the, the drinking game at home, we've mentioned, I think the phrase Silk Road about 20 times. So you, you should, <laughs> right. should, should be drunk by now. Uh, but you, you really talk about this, in the book that essentially the Silk Road is a marketing ploy. And that's not how it was referred to by people that live there or even Marco Polo or, you know, this was, it's a very recent sort of invention. And, you know, uh, your your book title also uses the Silk Road, right? I mean, successfully, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's 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 it works, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's exciting. It makes sense. Everyone knows it. So, you, you know, what I, I guess I want to try and understand, like, is that is that OK? You know, if we take a place that where people are living and name it something else that's not their name for it and then use that for our own purposes, um, is that something that that you're or, or we should be comfortable with? And, and how can we kind of strive to be authentic and, and honest with ourselves and with the people that live there about about these places? Yeah, fabulous question. Um, I certainly think anytime we we anytime we name something, there's sort of like an attempt at possession in that naming, and that can be um, you can mean that totally innocently, um, like with a, a, a book title, um, or it can be named in such a way that's very like cunning and self serving, and I mean, Silk Road as a term, yeah, it was like a 19th century geographer, German geographer that coined it just as a, a label for these vague trade networks that spread from Europe to Asia. Um, 
and silk was traded along them, but it, it certainly wasn't the only thing that was being uh, exchanged. And in a way, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's putting up a border around the idea of what Silk Road implies, like that any name does that. It sort of defines and, and confines whatever concept you're talking about. Um, but I think, yeah, if, if you recognize it as a, as a kind of wall, then you can figure out how to climb over it and under it. And um, I certainly hope my book, if people pick it up thinking it's about the Silk Road in the traditional sense of like focusing on trade and commodities and um, those kinds of, of economic exchanges, then they'll be sorely disappointed by what it, what it describes. So, you know, any name is also an opportunity for uh, s subversion and you can mm. kind of um, thwart people's expectations with names in a way that is kind of exciting and um, yeah, provocative. So, but yeah, there's certainly, a, I mean, it is a, Silk Road is a marketing ploy that the Chinese in particular have totally embraced. Like they've, it's Silk Road everything, Silk Road video cafe, Silk Road uh, restaurants. Um, and yeah, you can't blame them. It's People are drawn to it. It was so a I good guess name. there's some of that. Well, you it's know, a good it's, name. It's a good name. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I kind of, I, I want to end this this part, I guess, and, and maybe even talk about a, a bigger, more metaphysical question. I mean, you kind of throughout the book, you, you wrote about kind of the back and forth about how you felt about the, the problems we're dealing with here and, you know, what drove you to want to go to Mars or to, to leave. And, you know, you, you're kind of frustrated by that. And later in the book, you, you sort of talk about that you maybe switch back or change your mind or otherwise at that point you were like, you know, we're, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to stay here. This is, you know, humanity is here. We need to focus on that. I, I mean, it's, it, it is really tough, right? To think about these, these problems that we face as a species and let alone within our different countries and, and, and everything. And some people can become disillusioned and frustrated. And, and I guess I'm just curious about kind of where, where you stand now and, and in terms of what you think we can do and, and you know, how you feel that, you know, what your travels have, have taught you either way about how humanity can still come together. Yeah, well, maybe the big solace of the Silk Road is that it's proof that everything is constantly in flux. Um, when Marco Polo traveled it, he traveled a completely different landscape in every possible sense. The maps were different, you know, the nations we think are so solid and um, lasting along it. He didn't know by those names. Um, so I, I do think there is, you know, there's real hope in the fact that however harsh or horrifying <laughs> things might be, um, change is constant, the only constant, and um, things can change for the better as much as for the worse. And just because they've changed for the worse and yeah, in certain realms of life, um, certainly environmentally, human rights-wise, I feel like we're making gains. But yeah, there's a lot of terrible things playing out on this planet and travel will expose you to them. And just being uh, an aware citizen will reading newspapers in your home country will expose you to them. And I think the beauty of digging into history and digging into how other, how other countries have moved through massive transitions, say from like communism to democracy or, um, yeah, it's probably Kublai Khan's empire to what we see today. Um, there, there's a lot of hope in, in the fact that things are changing all the time. And uh, I feel like you can't go on a, a trip like Mel and I did without, without feeling weirdly hopeful about the future of life on the planet. I mean, you encounter so many people that are, that are decent and they just want, you know, love and the basics for their family and mean no ill will to anyone else. And, 
I do think those kinds of people are far more common than the tyrants and the, the you know, massive CEOs, heads of corporations that are inflicting harm left and right. Um, it's just a matter of how can we, how can we summon that more positive energy and, and put it to work. And at times it feels like there's no outlet for it. Like, and in a way, writing the book was trying to put some of that energy out in the world, like to, it might just dissipate, like lighting a, a match in Antarctica. But, um, I do think, you know, I spent a lot of time in Buddhist countries along the Silk Road and, um, there's so much kind of refreshing philosophical uh, wisdom in in these countries and cultures as far as the idea that like everything we do matters, everything has consequences and everything's connected. And you might not see how um, what you what you do matters on the largest scales on a daily basis, but I I do think in the the scales of the universe it does. And that's a, that's a hopeful thing. Um, yeah. Keep hope alive. Keep it alive. That's all yeah. we've got. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sure, I mean, it's, this is always the question, right? As soon as you finish something big, people always want to know what's, what's next. So, uh, it could be just a long nap, but I, I am curious, you know, <laughs> after you wrap up your big publicity tour, if you've got aspirations for another trip or, or what else you're you're thinking about um i'll certainly always crave like the unique experience of a, an epic expedition um just the sort of total commitment and and sort of shedding of everything else in your life that happens when you set off on a, on a grand journey um so i'm sure there's more of that in my future down the road but I, i've mostly found that my my wanderlust has gone local and I do live in this spectacular corner of um, North America, right on the edge of Alaska and the Yukon in Northern British Columbia. And I don't know, I, I find myself craving intimacy with, with where I am as opposed to when I was younger, always wanting to see what was happening elsewhere. Um, so I, I want to learn how to live more lightly on the land and, you know, be able to predict when the caribou might move through or when a certain flower is going to pop up in the spring. Um, that just like local knowledge, um, and long acquaintance with the place is what I'm craving. Maybe it's a direct function of, of skipping across the world, uh, so consistently for most of my life, um, that this idea of home, like really having roots somewhere, um, is so appealing. But yeah, uh, Thoreau talked about, he sort of bragged about how he had traveled a great deal in Concord, which is where he lived in Massachusetts. And that's kind of my aspiration for now is to travel a great deal in Atlin, which is the little community I live in. Um, yeah, and, and maybe circle around ideas about nomadism and, and restlessness versus rootedness. Um, mm. So we'll, we'll see how that all plays out on the page, but that's what I'm craving at the moment. No, it sounds good, and that, that makes sense, right? I think kind of our wants, needs, and desires are almost like a pendulum at times, and they can go back and forth as we experience one yeah. thing and fulfill ourselves in that way and then kind of swing back and find something else that find something else that we need and fulfill it, yeah. that desire. Yeah, Thoreau. Absolutely. Thoreau was great. I love, <laughs> I love reading Thoreau. I mean, I, yeah. I, there was some. I remember there was something I read where he like railed against dinner parties. Like he was like, I'm gonna <laughs> invite people over for dinner, but there's no reason that I should be paying for anything. Like they can bring their own food or Such something. Such a miser. Like that. Yeah, it was just like so Thoreau, and I was like, oh, okay, this guy's all good on you. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, that was it for my questions. So how about we just play a little thunder round? I'll ask you a couple quick getting to know you questions and, and we'll call it a day. Sound good? Okay. Hit me. Okay. Hit me what up. is your what is your favorite food and or drink? And you cannot answer instant coffee or instant noodles. <laughs> Definitely not. And neither of those were answers I was gonna give. Okay. I would say <sighs> pesto for food, mm. homemade pesto and drink um 
anything fizzy, like fizzy water with berries in it. Ooh, that sounds yeah. great. Done. So normally I ask people their favorite place they've ever been, but um, you just wrote a book about all your favorite places, I feel. <laughs> I kind of want to know where you would go if you could go anywhere, this planet or otherwise. I would love to go to the high Arctic, the high Canadian Mm. Arctic, like Axel Heiberg, Ellesmere Island, um, places that are in my own country and yet are so incredibly hard to reach, so expensive to get to um, that they're, they're effectively another planet. So yeah, I can't imagine ever being able to afford going there. So if I can finagle some kind of writing assignment there, I'd be thrilled. Yeah, get yourself a sponsor. Yeah. Okay. Ski well, trip. Everyone, yeah, everyone out there listening, get yeah. ready. She can wear your brand as she summons. <laughs> uh, okay, last question. If you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? Oh, it's illuminate ego too big an answer <laughs> no you can do whatever you okay. want yeah eliminate eliminate ego um okay two words of, oh two words no no i said that's that's it two words eliminate that, ego. okay i did it yeah that's very simple you did it that yeah fulfills the criteria okay that sounds good so this would eliminate ego for everyone yeah oh gosh that would change Cross everything board, no exceptions. obviously yeah no exceptions <laughs> Exactly. That's that's the idea. All right. Well, this has been so wonderful. Uh, in case you haven't figured out, this book is amazing and is filled with uh, discovery, dreams, exploration from trips all over the world. The book, again, Lands of Lost Borders, A Journey on the Silk Road by author Kate Harris. Kate, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks, John. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes.